All right, we're going to get started. <laughs> so welcome in the room, welcome online. Good to see you all beaming in from home or wherever you may be. Welcome to our other than human friends here. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> So we're here at the San Francisco Dharma Collective, a community-run organization propagating the teachings of Dharma and also bringing together community for um, music and other entertainment and social events. Um, so really wonderful to see the Dharma Collective starting to um, really expand and um, and really embody this uh, alternative way of being in the world. So tonight, uh, the series of classes is on ethics, embodiment of ethics. And as I've been saying um, during the series, I love that we're in an embodiment of an ethical way of being. We're going to talk a lot tonight about capitalism. And I love that the Dharma Collective kind of serves as an alternative form of Yes, running a business technically, but also doing it in a way that um, aligns with a lot of the ethics that we've been talking about uh, in this series. Um, so my name is Tig. For those of you that I haven't met, just looking online, a couple of new faces. Uh, welcome. So my name is Tig. Uh, I am a meditation teacher, a contemplative artist. I did my training to teach meditation at medical and research institutions. Uh, I trained at the University of Pennsylvania Medical Center, University of Massachusetts Medical School, and also uh, Brown, which is also where I teach now. Um, I'm also developing the Center for Mindfulness at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, we're just getting started with our pilot programming this summer, and I also teach uh, contemplative art courses at Pratt Institute. So a little bit about me, why I'm teaching this class, as I kind of explained in our other classes, um, kind of woke up in about 2012 and I was a marketing director in a corporate marketing organization and really saw very clearly the damage that was happening um, in many different ways to communities, to individuals, to the planet. Um, that I was directly participating in um, and just felt deeply unsatisfied with that. And over the course of my, my journey, have kind of come to identify it's this lack of ethics, a lack of a safety net. Um, so <clears throat> that is, it seems to be where a lot of the issues that we're facing, a lot of where it's suffering in the world is originating from. Um, and this realization that we can wait for systematic change uh, or we can start practicing alternatives to what's broken now in our own ways. And I do firmly believe that this kind of shift into a way of being in the world that is more beneficial for self and others really does start with the individual. Uh, so. Uh, that's kind of what dro drove me to um, this series of classes. Um, if you weren't here for the other um, three classes so far, no problem. We'll talk a little bit about some of those things that were covered there. As I mentioned tonight, we're going to be talking about compassion and how it relates to capitalism and um, how do we navigate those two concepts uh, or how do they fit together or not. Um, so... Let's, um, before we go any further, let's just take a moment to welcome ourselves into the space, uh, just check in with body and mind. Um, these, these conversations around ethics really require kind of a regulated nervous system. Uh, so let's just take some time, maybe about five or six minutes, maybe you like to close the eyes or just soften the gaze. with an invitation to make a transition from the outer world, a world of busyness and goals and striving, to creating a space inside ourselves for intention and ease. Noticing what energy you're carrying into our session tonight. What's the energy in the body right now? Perhaps at specific sensations or just a sense of sleepiness or 
some vivid energy. Checking in with the mind, mental formations, perhaps lingering energy from conversations or events that happened today. Maybe thoughts about what's to come in this session or perhaps our ever-present to-do list. Noticing the mood that you're in. Checking in with the emotions. Perhaps a combination of emotions right now. And we're just noticing what's here. We're not trying to fix or change anything. There's no particular way that you should or should not be in this moment. So giving yourself the precious gift of just allowing yourself to be exactly as you are right now. And then to help us settle in even more deeply, let's allow the awareness to drop back down into the body, noticing the sensations of being held by the contact beneath the body. So just letting your awareness scan the points of contact that your body might be making with the floor or a chair. And another gift that we can give ourselves here is allowing the awareness to drop out of the incessant thinking in the mind and come down and feel into the body. And feeling that steadiness of the ground rising up to meet you as in through the chair, or the floor, or cushion. As always, taking a moment here to acknowledge the land that you're on. If you're in San Francisco, the lands of the native Alani, the tribes, honoring and respecting their sacrifices. And then with the awareness of this steady ground beneath us, let's take a deep breath in and invite a sense of lengthening along the spinal column, perhaps sitting up a little bit taller, coming into a dignified posture that helps cultivate a sense of vividness to the attention. And then on the next out breath, balancing that uprightness with a sense of ease. So letting go of that out breath, relaxing, softening. And if it feels comfortable staying with this idea for a few cycles of breath, breathing in a sense of vividness, focus, concentration, and breathing out a sense of softening and relaxation. On the next out breath, allowing the muscles of the face to soften, the jaw to be loose, the shoulders relaxed. Breathing in the next breath all the way down into the abdomen. And as you breathe out, a sense of softening through the abdomen, the pelvic floor. A couple more cycles of Breathing in, concentration, and breathing out, relaxation.
And so here we are grounded, a sense of vivid attention and balance with a sense of ease through mind and body. And from here, let's set an intention for our time together tonight. Perhaps to be open-minded, to be non-judgmental, maybe to be patient or respectful. On the next in-breath, let's follow the air as it flows into the body. And on the next out-breath, we'll start to make our transition out of this opening practice, perhaps inviting some movement back into the body, opportunity to make some gentle stretches, returning back to open eyes if they were closed. <clears throat> So thanks for joining me with that short practice. It's always good to just mark that there's a transition happening from this kind of outer world, we call it kind of street behavior, uh, into uh, an acknowledgement that we're coming into a circle together and um, practicing and exploring what these uh, concepts of embodied ethics can mean for us. So um, just bringing the crew up to speed here. Um, so we're talking about embodied ethics. So just a couple definitions that we've been kind of working with uh, in the past couple classes. So ethics really being the system of uh, moral principles that govern our behavior and our actions. So morals really being kind of the guiding principles behind that. And then the ethics being how we take action on that, how it shows up in our behavior and, how we move about in the world. Um, in this case, the overriding theme is that it's for the benefit of not just self, but also for others. Um, you also hear the word secular being used, so non-spiritual, non-religious. You don't have to be a Buddhist to practice ethics. Uh, in fact, it's universal. So uh, these ethics are secular in that they are not dependent on any religious dogma or doctrine. They uh, also are not dependent on any supernatural powers. Um, we have science-based evidence on how ethics and ethical living actually is conducive to our own health. So it feels good. It's good for our health to kind of move through the world with this uh, ethical mindset. And then also the word embodied. So a lot of times when we talk about ethics, it can get very intellectual, very heady. Uh, and we'll definitely have time for discussion tonight, but really the invitation here is to think about how this is embodied, how not only does it feel in the body when we're talking, listening and practicing, but then how do we take this out into the world? Um, not just a theoretical concept or something that stays um, in our practice, but actually we take it out into the world and embody these, um, these values and, and ways of being. Um, we talked about the two pillars of secular ethics, um, so not necessarily ethics in and of themselves, but in the absence of any religious worldview or dogma, we do need something to base these conversations on. So we kind of explored for the past two classes the, um, the first pillar of interdependence, uh, interconnectivity of everything. So what is happening to one affects the other. Um, we're not living separate, independent in silos. Um, so this idea of interdependence. And then the second is our shared humanity, uh, which also really relates to this idea of compassion and the common, common aspects of our human experience is this um, desire to feel good and to reduce suffering. And we talked a lot about how that's not just true for humans, but also animals and even non-sentient beings, plants, trees. They want to grow towards where there's sunlight and water, and they want to protect themselves from being injured or hurt. So um, this is a common trait of all life forms that we have this, that we can kind of um, find this shared experience that we have of wanting to feel good and, um, and less pain. 
Last week, we talked specifically about the ethic of do no harm or ahimsa, as you might have um, heard it called. Uh, and so we talked about um, how this might show up in our lives, how we might be causing harm, whether it's un- intentional or unintentional. Um, we did a practice, a mindfulness-based practice on how we might be causing harm to ourselves in our practice, judging, analyzing, evaluating, uh, kind of beating ourselves up for the wandering mind or not not being the perfect meditator. Uh, so some experiential practice with do no harm. And then we also dipped into forgiveness because where harm is, there also needs to be forgiveness, both of ourselves and of others. Um, so if you're interested in kind of going deeper in any of those, those videos are all on YouTube and they're labeled by class number. So check those out. Um, tonight, as I've been mentioning, we're going to dive into compassion and capitalism. Um, talk a little bit about compassion. We'll have a practice uh, that's compassion based tonight. And then um, I'll present some ideas around the compatibility of compassion and capitalism. And then I'd love to leave a good chunk of time at the end for conversation and discussion. And that's really the premise of um, this series is it's about practice, conversation. What does that mean for you? I'm not here to judge anyone. I do find fault in the systems. I do think that that capitalism is destructive, but I don't judge anyone for participating in it. I participate in it, even though I'm trying to lessen my role in it. I still participate in it when I go to the grocery store or um, anything that I buy. <clears throat> so just want to say that, acknowledge that, um, that aspect. Um, so a couple quick agreements, uh, just seeing this every opportunity of our time together as practice. So bringing your full attention to what your felt experience is. How does it show up in the body? What is um, what is activated in the mind and the heart as you hear and practice? Um, also, uh, an agreement that we would respect each other's differences. So that includes some of my point of view, your point of view. I do believe that our strength is in our diversity. And so it's okay to have opinions or point of views that are different from mine or anyone else in the room um, that's encouraged, uh, but that we do that in this container of respect uh, for each other. Um, and really, you know, uh, trying your best not to give advice or cut anyone off when they're talking. Uh, speaking from the I perspective rather than the you perspective just kind of keeps this more in the realm of um, kind of our nonviolent, non accusatory conversations that we had last week uh, with Do No Harm. And as always, taking care of yourself. So if um, you need to take a break, take a break for those in the room, get some tea, use the restrooms at home. Uh, you're welcome to turn your cameras off or stretch a little bit, whatever you need to do to take care of yourself. Uh, and really stay in that kind of your your zone of experience that is conducive for growth and learning. So if you notice that you're starting to really get triggered or really start to do the opposite, kind of go into a disassociation or zoning out, uh, maybe it's time to take a break, maybe open the eyes if they're closed, look around the room, return to the breath with a feeling of uh, support beneath you to anchor yourself. So it's an invitation to really take care of yourself here. Um, as I've been doing in our other classes, I also think it's important that I just start off by acknowledging some of my own biases. Uh, the first was I do participate in, in this system. Uh, I did work in the system uh, and I found a lot of flaw and fault in it. And so I carry that bias with me as I teach about capitalism in particular. Um, and I also want to acknowledge I am in a male body with white skin, and that has afforded me certain privileges and points of view, especially when we talk about ethics. And so I think it's important to acknowledge that I strive to teach universally, um, but my lived experience is different from your all's. And uh, it's, it's more than okay to speak up if there's a difference or if I say something that is not true for your experience, and we can kind of grow and learn through that together. <clears throat> so with that all said, let's talk a little bit about compassion and then we'll practice. So in the traditional lineages, compassion is a desire or an aspiration to alleviate suffering, both of self and others. Um, 
different from empathy where empathy is more about feeling what someone else is feeling um, or sympathy, which is feeling bad, feeling sorry for someone suffering. Compassion is really, it starts with this kind of desire or this wish or aspiration to reduce suffering and then evolves into taking action. Um, so that's kind of like the, the working definitions that we'll be using tonight for compassion. And really the, the ground of our compassion is our own suffering. Part of the reason that I feel that we live in a society that really lacks compassionate response is because so many people are turning away from their own suffering. They're numbing, avoiding, pushing away things that don't feel good for them. And so when that happens, it's really hard to feel compassion for others. Um, so I like to think of our, um, our gratitude and love is kind of the well of our kindness and then our suffering and our experiences that are unpleasant is the well for our compassion. If we didn't know suffering, we wouldn't be able to wish others to be free from that compassion. So with that, let's practice a little bit of compassion. Um, we're going to do a relatively traditional compassion practice in some ways. Um, where we'll call to mind first our own suffering, suffering of a loved one, and we'll offer them these aspirations um, for alleviation from that suffering. Um, I'll offer some phrases that you might want to try out. I'll offer some visualizations. Um, and we'll expand that from ourselves to a loved one to also groups that might be suffering. We're gonna try something a little bit different at, towards the end of the meditation where I'm gonna invite you to actually verbalize, name <clears throat> suffering that's happening in the world out loud. Um, so kind of having that um, audible experience of everyone sharing how different groups might be suffering. Um, so if you're at home, unmuting yourself and we'll just do a popcorn style once I prompt it. Um, if it feels comfortable for you to just speak that out loud. Um, and then we'll offer compassion for all those groups. Okay, so this will just be about a 15 minute practice. Um, so finding a way of being in the body that feels supportive for the next 15 minutes. Maybe it's laying down, maybe standing up. <clears throat> sure, sounds good, thanks Noam. Yeah, so for those in the room, just speaking loud enough that the folks online will be able to hear. <clears throat> Thanks, Noam. So let's find a posture that feels supportive to continue cultivating that sense of a vivid awareness, but also a sense of ease. And allowing the body to settle into stillness, knowing that you can move, change positions, scratch, stretch, whatever comes up in this practice that would feel beneficial for you. Perhaps taking a moment to return to an awareness of the breath or the feeling of contact of the body, the chair, the floor, just to ground and orient yourself into the present moment. As we start to transition into this practice of cultivating, cultivating compassion, let's come to our own lived experience and call to mind a way that you might be experiencing stress or something unpleasant right now in your life. an aspect of life that feels uncomfortable or that is difficult or challenging right now. Maybe it's a relationship or something at work. And see what it's like to work with something that is salient for you. It might be happening either now or in the recent past.
if it feels okay, perhaps visualizing if it's an event or it's a person, maybe seeing yourself in the situation that's difficult. Whether it's a visualization or a memory or just a knowing of this difficulty, first taking a moment to allow it to be here. This is part of life right now. And instead of pushing against it or even just temporarily stop trying to change it and just notice how it feels. Perhaps that includes recognizing a sensation that may be arising in the somatic field as you reflect on this difficulty. Noticing how the mind, the body, the heart is responding to this reflection on something unpleasant. And let's start by offering ourselves some compassion as we meet this difficulty. Perhaps acknowledging first that it makes sense that you're feeling this way. It's reasonable that this situation is causing you some level of distress. And perhaps trying on some of these phrases, repeating silently after me, or just resting with the sentiments of these words, but offering these aspirations as a gift to yourself. May I accept this difficulty exactly as it is. May I accept myself exactly as I am. May I be kind to myself as I face this challenge. May I have all the courage and compassion I need. May I be at ease as I navigate this challenge. And perhaps you'd like to place a hand or two over the heart center or perhaps one hand on the opposite shoulder as a half embrace. If there is a specific sensation arising in the body associated with this difficulty, maybe placing the hand over that area just as a way of offering yourself a sense of presence and nurturing. Maybe breathing into any unpleasant sensations or perhaps visualizing on the next in-breath that you could breathe in a warm, nurturing light. And remember that this is just a practice. So we're checking out how it feels to offer ourselves some compassion. May we be free from this stress or suffering. You're welcome to leave your hand making contact with the heart or another part of the body if that feels supportive or perhaps allowing the hands to come back down to the lap as we make a transition now and calling to mind a, a loved one or someone close to you in your life that might be encountering some difficulty right now. Perhaps imagining this person in front of you or perhaps seeing them in the situation that's difficult for them. And notice how they might be responding to this difficulty. perhaps an expression on their face. 
maybe a constriction in the body. And as you hold this image in the mind's eye of this person that's close to you that's suffering, notice how it feels to witness this. What arises in your heart, in your body, as you notice, see, visualize, and know the suffering of this loved one? Perhaps visualizing a light extending from your heart center to them. Cultivating a a sense of alleviation of their suffering, a desire to liberate them from this suffering. And perhaps offering them silently in your mind your own way of saying it makes sense that you're feeling this way. This seems really hard. Affirming their struggle and their challenge. Perhaps repeating these phrases or just resting with the words as an offering, a gift to your loved one. May you accept this challenge that you're facing right now. May you accept yourself and how you're meeting this difficulty. May you be kind to yourself. May you have all the courage and compassion that you need to face this difficulty. And may you be at ease as you navigate this challenge. And remembering that this is a practice, so no expectations of what you should or should not be feeling. If you're noticing the mind wandering away from the practice of compassion, getting lost in thought or sounds or other distractions, that's okay. Just use your mindfulness to notice that that's happening and return back to this image of your loved one. And extending these wishes of compassion. May they be free. May they be at ease. And again, notice what it feels like in the body to offer these aspirations of compassion to your loved one. Perhaps seeing them smiling as they receive your wishes, the warm glow from your heart center. And as we make another transition in this practice, letting the image of this person begin to dissolve And now calling to mind someone that you might be having a difficult time with, perhaps a recent difficult conversation, maybe someone that just rubs you the wrong way, could be in your your personal life, in your work life, maybe someone on the world stage that's causing suffering for others. And see that this person too also has difficulty. They have fears, anxieties. They may be struggling in ways that we're not even aware of. Oftentimes behavior that causes us or others to suffer roots in that person's own unresolved wounds or their own stress or suffering. And so what is it like to 
consider that this difficult person may be dealing with their own challenges. And what is it like to offer them compassion? To say silently in your mind to this person, it makes sense you are the way that you are. I understand why you may be causing the suffering for myself or other people. And offering them these aspirations. May you be kind to yourself. May you have the courage to turn and face what it is that's challenging. May you be free from the ways that you're suffering. And again, just noticing what this practice is like. It might be more difficult to extend this compassion to this difficult person than it is the loved one or self, and that's okay. Just noticing what's arising in the body and mind as we practice extending these wishes of compassion to this difficult person. Perhaps even considering extending that visualization of light or nurturing warm energy from your heart to this person, only if that feels comfortable for you. And then releasing the image of this difficult person from your mind's eye. Taking a moment to ground yourself once again in the breath or the sensations of contact in the body. And then we'll make one final transition here to calling to mind groups of people, perhaps groups that you're a part of or groups that you're aware of that are experiencing suffering, oppression, discrimination. And just calling to mind these groups of people that are experiencing suffering. And in a moment, we'll open up to listen to each other as we name the suffering that's happening in the world, whether it's a group that you're a part of, a group that you're aware of, maybe a loved one is a part of, but just naming the suffering in the world. And so as you're ready, vocalizing that with our group, naming the suffering of others in the world. My sisters and my brother. All those who have lost someone recently. The wars and other uh, conflict framework in Ukraine and Syria and Palestine. The, pe the people in India who are suffering under a heat wave. The gay and trans people who are being legislated against.
paternalists and authoritarian countries. Mm -hmm. yeah, the discrimination and bias and hate towards trans and queer people. All the people in the U.S. that don't have clean water to drink. The First Nations people of Canada who are suffering with increased um, drug overdoses. And so noticing what it's like to extend a heart of compassion to hold all of the suffering in the world, to recognize and acknowledge it, to investigate how it feels in the body and the mind and the heart to hear. And to extend these same aspirations of compassion to all of these suffering peoples perhaps visualizing this light, this warmth of energy emanating from the heart center, extending to all of these groups of people. And perhaps offering these phrases of compassion to all those who are suffering. May you be kind to yourself. May you have the courage you need to face this difficulty. May you be at ease as you face this suffering. And may you be liberated from the unpleasantness of this challenge. If there's any other phrases that you would like to offer silently in your mind's eye, in your heart's eye to these groups of suffering. And not letting go of any thought forms or visualization and just taking a moment to check in what's alive for you right now after this practice of compassion. What parts of this practice felt effortless and which parts may have been difficult? How far can the heart of compassion stretch to hold all of this suffering? And there never really is an end to a practice like this. So even though we're coming to a conclusion of this formal practice, may we continue in our session tonight and even beyond to embody a compassionate way of orienting ourselves to our own suffering, the suffering of others in the world. So as we come to an end of this formal practice, taking some time to once again, invite some movement into the body, returning to open eyes if they were closed.
So thank you all for not just that practice, but participating and kind of creating that container for us to apply our compassion. I felt as people were naming naming different groups, I almost felt like my heart just expanding more and more to include everything that was being said out loud. It was a very expansive practice for me. And so I'd love to hear kind of what, what that might've been like for you. What did you notice? What was effortless? What was hard? Any questions about the practice? I, I felt that it was um, more easily accessible when I was willing to know, mm. um, rather than uh, out into the world. Mm. Mm -hmm. What do you think's behind that? Um, just, just the close, the intimacy, <laughs> you know, and it's just being able to identify with with the feelings. Mm. Yeah. Um, and maybe it's individual versus group, you know, like one to one versus one to many mm -hmm. um, as well. But yeah. And then as far as the practice was concerned, I definitely felt my chest, my shoulders, like my shoulders falling and becoming a little bit more comfortable. Right. And some warmth and breath <clears throat> in my chest. And, mm. You know, the acceptance the acceptance of, of the, the feeling, mm. the, the warm embrace. Mm. Yeah. Like yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Josh. Yeah, and we know from science, we stop producing cortisol when we practice compassion. So these kind of pleasant feelings for, for Josh, it was kind of in the in the chest and the shoulders, but we we know that that practice practice can help alleviate our own stress and suffering. It feels good to offer love and compassion to others. Thanks for sharing that. I felt strangely, oddly distant and neutral. Distant and neutral. Yeah, like I felt like I was sort of faking it, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't know really so much. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was it like when you, so that was the, the feeling of kind of neutrality when you were practicing the compassion, what was it yeah. like to call to mind the suffering of other people? I guess I felt protective of myself. Mm -hmm. So maybe yeah, that's something that's not in very personal mm -hmm. And that's an area that I'm really aware of. Mm -hmm. Where they're stuck and trapped in mm -hmm. believing, you know, we grew up in a happy family and all that bullshit. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I can't touch it. Right. So, so you said you said you, you protecting of self. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's too too much. Too much. Too much. Yeah. 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 Thanks for being the real. Journalist the thing really got to me because I follow that closely. It's an issue like concern about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's one more in India, like the most really. Mm -hmm. um, Can you finish that? It really yeah. what? Huh? It really what? It, how did it, how did it, how did it make you feel? Got me angry. Angry. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. really, I think, yeah, I think the feelings are around. It's funny because I didn't really feel very much for starving people, but I did more for journalists who, um, because I think it's such a threat to all of us that uh, voices that can express different opinions and truth and honest reporting. Um, are, are being, you know, silence. Mm -hmm. It's happening more and more. And folks at home on Zoom, can you hear what's said in the room a little bit? Um, so it's just being described as kind of um, the, the first part was around the protection of self of not actually going to that place of fully feeling, allowing the feelings of yeah, suffering. Okay, thanks. I'm Matthew. Um, yeah, so I was saying, Gosh, I don't know what I was saying, but um, 
I, I did not, my heart did not open during this exercise. Mm -hmm. It stayed kind of shut. Mm -hmm. And I think it's self-protection. Mm -hmm. And I started with siblings and I, you know, I mean, I grew up in a household of not unimaginable, but pretty horrible things. And uh, people always say, why do you laugh when you say that? And it's true. Um, yeah. And, but the journalist thing really did hit me, which Josh had mentioned that the journalists who are being silenced in under autocratic regimes, um, that hit me really powerfully with a lot of anger, anger, and right. anger mainly, but also fear because of the, of the, the consequences of freedom of press being silenced mm -hmm. in India, particularly I'm following kind of closely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for being vulnerable about that. And I think it's, it really illustrates a lot of this, that there, it is difficult, you know, it's not pleasant to turn and look at suffering and there's a, a concept, particularly in self-compassion called backdraft. And it's this idea that there might be, you know, with firefighters that there's a smoldering ember, and when the door opens and fresh oxygen rushes into the room, the whole thing explodes. And so this is this is very true for our hearts as well. You know, like they're sealed shut because we don't want to feel that. And then there's this simmering anger or fill in the blank, destructive emotion that's simmering in there. And the minute that we start opening it, it's like that fresh air, that fresh oxygen that just explodes. Yeah. And um, so just kind of normalizing that, like that's actually a part of this process. I love, uh, I was on a Vipassana last year and our teacher said, um, take sm three small bites and then go do something joyful. And I thought that that was really skillful. Like when we look at yeah. this extreme suffering that's in the world and it can feel so overwhelming um, that if we just kind of stay with it a little bit kind of take a little piece off, be with it for a little bit, whatever feels comfortable and then go do something, you know, that, that makes you feel more regulated and stable. And over time we can kind of chip away. It's almost like the backdraft example, kind of like venting the room first before you open it. And I just want to say in terms of self-compassion, I don't feel bad about not feeling compassionate. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. There's no, yeah, right. And that's what, you know, the-, the Tonight, yeah. tonight. Yeah, thanks for saying that. <clears throat> How was it to offer compassion to the difficult person? <laughs> Okay. Um, I I was I didn't say it out loud, but I was uh, thinking a lot about uh, young people, kids who are suffering neglect or abuse or um, and and then when when you. Uh, gave some of those phrases toward the end. It just felt really like useless, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I'm sure that's true, you know. For some, you know, the sort of like I was also thinking about my mother, who's 90 and 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 not in great health. And I and and the, those phrases would be perfect for her you know may you be able to face what you're dealing with may you you know have kindness for yourself all those kinds of things but it just didn't it just didn't it it felt not not even useless but also like you know fuck that like don't tell a kid who's in a situation like some of the ones i was imagining to, you know, oh, just, you know, be okay with it, you know? So it was, I, I had a strong reaction to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, thanks for being real. Yeah. And um, it's also part of the practice. So just noticing being with that, when there was an invitation to offer your own phrases to yeah. this group, what came up for you? You don't have to share the phrases, but was that any different? Was there more meaningful? Yeah, phrases? I was like, may may you may there be someone in your life who helps you out, who Beautiful. you know rescues you or whatever. Yeah, yeah. right. Like they need help from yeah. someone else. It's not there on them to, 
you know, overcome it or deal with it or whatever. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I, I, and I think this, this points to two things. One is that we can make up our aspirations, you know, as we uh, do these love and kindness, compassion practices, that we can come up with phrases that work for us, you know, or, or, or allow us to feel something that's more relevant to that actual suffering, right? So great that you got there with that. And then the second is that these are just aspirations, they're wishes. Yeah. And this is the starting point, you know, so it might be an indicator that you have already been wishing and aspiring for these people to be free from suffering and feeling like it's not enough. Yeah. And so what I love about um, I actually kind of sitting that way now is like these deities of compassion. We see their statues. They're not cross legged. One of their feet, one of their foot is on the ground. So they're ready to take action. Mm -hmm. It can't just be this passive wish or aspiration for me i consider practices like this to be kind of the training ground like the fine tuning or seeing where there's barriers or where there might be difficult or where my aspirations might not be relevant and then going out into the world and doing something about it and you know that for me a lot of that is capitalism i really see a, this is the root of a lot of the suffering especially some of the things that were named out loud from our collective group come from our system of economy and so for me it might feel yeah a little neutral i think to kind of wish others that are suffering as a result of capitalism in my meditation, but then I need to take that out and embody it. And that's really what this whole series of classes is exploring is how do we embody this? How do we go out into the world and actually look at behaviors that we might be doing or systems that we might be participating in that are actually causing oppression and suffering? Um, it's, there's a very you know wide range of ways that we can take action that are different for everyone. But um, I like this, I have here this task force for global health, they kind of frame compassion, starting with awareness, which is what we are cultivating in that practice, just awareness, and then developing the empathy, the emotional resonance of what, what that might feel like. And then that leads to taking action to help alleviate the suffering. So um, yeah, th thanks for appreciating that. What awareness and what? Empathy. Oh, what's it? And then action. Yeah. And I see someone online has their hand up. So go ahead and unmute yourself. Hey, what's up? I'm Krishna. I joined a little bit late, but um, yeah, um, I, I sounds like you're doing like a loving kindness practice, expanding compassion or some type of generosity or goodwill to being starting from easier beings, probably to harder beings where there may be blocks to remove the blocks and then kind of having a uh, I guess a desired wish for more loving kindness and being able to take an action off of it, maybe in the world at some point. So, yeah. um, so my, uh, challenge recently has been, I think that I would say 50% of my suffering is probably just somatic based on like previous emotions. And then 50% is because um, it's easy to get stuck in ideology. I define like my de degree of suffering is mostly cannot cut through an ideology. Do not have a perspective that's big enough to cut through ideology. Um, I'll give an example, which is a little bit challenging, but um, I had a friend who was basically training to be a police officer at some point. And he was my best friend at the time. And he was a really good person. And um, he actually wanted to quit being a police officer during like the Black Lives Matter protests. I actually said that we need really good police officers because we still need people to create security and peace. And you'd be probably better off than majority of the officers. And we need people. And then also um, you can still honor your friends and other family members and other things. And that's kind of where he was at. And he was like, nope, I'm going to quit now. Like, this is not good time to be a police officer. I'd rather do something else. I never want to be in a position where I see any of my friends like on a different side, even if it's like protesting, because I don't have full agency. Like I have to follow orders. And I said, yeah, but one day you can be the guy giving the orders. He's like, that may be true. And I may give the good orders, but I never want to be in a position where I have to follow someone else's orders. And I can't make a decision that's executive based on uh, how others are feeling. And it was interesting because that 
we had many conversations about that during COVID. It was actually like fairly eye-opening because he looked like he was trying really hard. Like he's going to college, taking multiple classes, watching different perspectives. And in that circumstance, I was like, I need to cut through ideology to like talk to my friend, like he's a regular person. It's not that I don't have perspectives. I did. I even shared him my perspective and saying, I think this stuff is like not that good. I think there's a lot of issues and maybe not your police forces or these specific areas, but in some areas in the country there are. But then we had like an ongoing discussion and we kind of still remain friends after all of that. <laughs> so that was an example of, well, me trying to cut through ideology basically, yeah. because I learned things from speech and debate. I had my perspectives and this is kind of like an emerging thing, but I didn't see my friend as a bad guy. If anything, I want, I was trying to boost him up like as a police officer during that time. So that's a challenge for me. Like, how do I cut through that? I work as a business analyst for like a major tech firm and my job is hard. Like it's really hard just doing the like regular things. Like I feel like I have to be extremely like almost like a kind of like a small, like low level genius to like influence people, get them on board with things. So I found that it's like pretty difficult because like on the one hand, I'm like, okay, care about compassion, care about a lot of beings. On the other hand, I'm like, need to develop skills, understand and like analyze systems and then just understand how systems work. And I just get stuck because I always, almost always feel like I just choose an ideology and start just becoming very rigid and just fixated on one thing. Mm So I was wondering if you had any like wisdom or thoughts. Well, the last part of what you were sharing, what I heard was you you had talked about there's the compassion on one side and then there's the understanding on the other side. They're kind of the same. You know, we need the understanding in order to get to the compassion. So I, I from what you're describing, it feels like you're you're there. You're you're able to empathize and at least seek to understand, which is the doorway to compassion. So semantics maybe they are two sides of the same coin but i think more for me it's more linear understanding and then compassion arises out of that understanding then compassion arises out of that yeah i think that's that's a that's a pretty fair point i guess for me it's more like developing understanding that goes beyond an ideological frame of reference yeah. that's yeah. pretty hard because the moment i like drop one ideology i dig my heels in another so i'm like okay this also feels rigid at some point i even want to drop buddhist ideologies too because i was like now i'm just becoming ideological there so yeah right and the and the buddha wasn't a buddhist he didn't even have that ideology right he was just so i what well, what was striking to me and what you just said you mentioned the word feel it feels this way it feels that way ideology is cognitive it's absent of feeling and so I think, again, you're on the right track because you, we have to be able to tune into how things feel in order to guide us through. Like we know it doesn't feel good. What, what, name, fill in the blank ethic. <laughs> it doesn't feel good when it's not being, we're not living according to it. Uh, it doesn't feel good to see destruction in the world. It doesn't feel good to see things falling apart or people suffering. So it's really more about the, you know, I'm touching my heart, but it's like the felt experience in the body, I think is what helps us cut through a lot of that ideology. Yeah. It's also the reason why this, this series so heavily focuses on more secular nature rather than any kind of um, ideology that requires faith or, or, you know, blind faith. So thanks for sharing yeah. that. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, there's a, a follow-up clarifying question. Um, in the chat, um, which uh, was Cecily asking, uh, what does ideology mean, please? And Kinga uh, replied with a set of beliefs of a group or a person, which is correct. But I also wanted to uh, give Krishna a moment to, to um, maybe reflect more specifically if, um, if, if there's something that you're meaning by that that isn't covered by that. Yeah, so like ideology is typically defined as a set of beliefs, but I go a step further and I say it basically is like a systemic body of concepts about your understanding of culture, life, and like a society. So you can even say like the ideology, you didn't choose the ideology fully, like to a certain extent. 
now that's not to say you can't gain awareness and then have more understanding but like you're basically you do have individual choice individual responsibility personal responsibility your own personal growth that's all true but um your ideology it, it feels kind of like like a way of structuring your thinking in a top-down fashion or to get like results in a right. certain way. But the thing is, you didn't actually generate it. Like that thing is it happened almost automatically because like that that's the part that gets tricky. So it's not that it's wrong to have an ideology or wrong to frame things from a particular ideology. All ideologies actually reveal some degree of truth, generally speaking. Now, some reveal less truth because they're just way more destructive than others. That what I mean by truth is they reflect something that is about like like a frame of reference or a structure. So the trick here is that one ideology, you want to kind of break out a little bit slowly and generate enough awareness. So like, it's hard to give an example, but like, I think a good example would be like, like um, people have different frame of references based on where they're growing up and they develop their political or social or economic ideologies. It's not like, um, like I'm not saying that certain ideologies may not be more beneficial, but the general idea is that when you're thinking exclusively through an ideology, you're kind of generating a story or like a frame about the whole world, like a big worldview, we can say. And then that can make it very uh, easy to like, basically structure your ideology but you kind of will um position it as like i think a good example would be like if a buddhist talked to a hindu as hindu person or something and be like there's nothing in common with buddhism and hinduism they have nothing to do with each other i'm like that just sounds like purely ideological like or like these religions have nothing to say about other religions or are not related in any such way or something about politics. Like I couldn't relate to a person of a different political view or a different political class. That's just it sounds ideological to me. And what I mean by cut through ideology is seeing beyond that lens and kind of getting to that non-dual understanding that requires you to basically transcend a certain like degree of maybe culture or personal limitation and then, or th mode of thinking, and then go a little bit beyond it to kind of include more space for more rooms of, things um and it's mostly about a lot of part of cut through ideology it sounds really aggressive but it's more about like generating space to be able to hold different frames of reference if i yeah. just said like oh like a bad person's bad because they're bad i'm like this is definitely not holding space fully for right. those things but it may be necessary for me to do that if i need to like defend myself or take steps to move away at a certain time but to get beyond yeah. it requires me to have that bigger understanding going like they're probably really bothered or triggered by something that is affecting their psyche and they feel under threat or under psychology. And I can understand having had a similar experience to that or gone beyond it. So it's hard to give an example that's concrete, but I think one example is when I try to just talk to my yeah. friend as a person. <laughs> Thank you for that. And, and understand to understand that's the root of everything that you are articulating is this need to understand. You don't actually have to relate. You don't actually have to empathize, right. In order to understand why someone might be acting the way that they are, even ourselves. And I really like, uh, there's, uh, many gems in what you were sharing there. And one in particular that I really liked is that you were talking about, it can't be top down. And that's the whole premise of embodied ethics is that it has to start from within here because otherwise you're just taking it on blind faith. If it's not actually your felt experience, then you are just following someone else's path or someone else's ideology, uh, which is not inherently wrong, but it needs to be balanced with the felt experience of the individual. Um, so I really like the way that you were kind of bringing those th two things together, the understanding and then the the feeling, the felt experience of it. So thank you. Yeah, that's basically what I was getting at. I, I think the last comment I'd have would be that when you said the word felt sense, that sounds pretty accurate because there are some things that you um, will just overlook because um, your like thinking structure is operating a certain way, but the felt sense has a different I guess, frame, which is the body frame of reference. 
And right. because there's that friction, then there feels like there's a tension between your ideology and your basically way of living or whatever. And the interaction between that produces, well, new possibilities and new ways of making meaning. So that's a lived yeah. thing. Though. So you have to kind of find how to do that. Um, that's one and that's in the, in the framework of this class, it's practice, you know, it's feeling into the body. Um, so appreciate that. We do need to move on. I do see there is another hand raise. Um, but I can't see who it is. Oh. Hi, hi, Tig. This is Perry. Um, hey, Perry. Hey, you know, on the topic of uh, ideology, a couple of things came up for me. Um, this whole Western societal thing about self is greater than the whole is more important than the whole. And then we go to work and we're, we're told it's opposite. It's the, the team that matters. It's, it's the, the, the unit output that matters more than the individual. And I think that strikes quite a, a contrast with you know, a, a person's chosen um, ideology of the whole is greater than, than the person, the individual person. And uh, I find that to bring up struggle for me because that, that's my chosen ideology. Yet I live in a Western world where, you know, that's not often the case. And on the topic of uh, compassion, I was noticing a few things during this one. Um, it brings back a memory of a, a monk who said to me on the topic of compassion, compassion is defined as where sincere loving kindness meets pain. And I really felt that in this practice tonight. Mm. And I, I found for myself that the key to be sincerity, that not just going through the motions of meta, but actually feeling it and wishing in it, wishing it. And it was towards the end, almost like a Tonglen experience of trying to transform that suffering of others and the suffering in the self into, you know, something good, like like a, a realized compassion, something that is that is truly felt, and uh, I really appreciated it because I could uh, I could really dig it tonight. Mm. Thanks for sharing that, Perry. I have a question for you if you're up to answering. So you, there were two parts to what you just shared. Kind of one on how do we how do you resolve living in a world that doesn't match up to your ideology? Talking more about like the whole be more more um, attuned to what's good for the whole versus the individual, but then living in a Western society that is not aligned with that. And then the second part about what you were sharing is the kind of felt experience of compassion, leaning a little bit closer to Metta and Tonglen. Where do those two things come together? Living in a world that is fundamentally different from our compassionate ideology. <laughs> with developing that felt experience in the practice? How, how can those two things support each other maybe? I suspect that the second is the solution to the first. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I agree. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for sharing that, Perry. It is hard, you know, I, I, my, my experience is very similar, you know, I, I have a, a very strong felt embodied experience inside of me of compassion. I don't, it does, it, sometimes I actually have to hold it in a little bit more because it can just become so overwhelming. Um, but then how do I live and operate and move through a world, especially in a city like this, where there's just constant suffering everywhere you look, you know, and so it, I have found that, yes, compassion is, it's almost like a uh, 
ointment that allows me to move through a very sharp and different difficult world the compassion like oh i understand how we got here it makes sense it makes sense that people consider things different from them to be a threat it makes sense that we live in a paradigm where our survival is based uh on our jobs we have to work to live you know so it makes sense to me that's the early stages i think of me being able to move through the world in a more compassionate frame of mind rather than getting pissed off and angry all the time um which is one of the themes that we talked about in our first class it's just like anger about the way that the world is anger about things that are happening to our loved ones or even people that we might not even know um i i know that th again this is the well this is the fuel for what allowed that that anger that discontent that um dissatisfaction that we might feel about the world is the fuel for the compassion that we need to operate in it it's all linked so thank you for for pointing to that was there another hand up no okay great so good conversation thank you everyone for sharing both about the practice the ideology compassion moving through the world I think I'd like to extend this class into next week to kind of relieve some pressure of trying to get through the whole capitalism part of it. But I would like to at least start the conversation, um, kind of how we can how we can um, start naming some of these unethical ways of being in our economy. And so to do that, just to start off the conversation, I want to read. Um, it's about three, three paragraphs. Um, these are excerpts from an article that was written by Ramani um, Dorvasala, who is an American psychotherapist um, of Indian background. Um, and the title of this is Capitalism and Compassion, Can They Coexist? So as I read these excer excerpts, you can kind of just bring your awareness to not just the words, but how you feel about them and any thoughts that they might um, stir up in you. And then we can start our conversation and continue it next week. In the free market, the bottom line is simply the bottom line. It's quantitative, cold, reductionist, and does not reflect human capital, just financial profit. Capitalism has become largely about self-interest, consumerism, sleight of hand, and the bottom line. Our rubrics of success are so often tied into bottom lines, economic success, and material outcomes that we do not pause to consider whether the traits that generate these successes translates to the stuff that close relationships and families need to function and thrive. I'm going to say that again. Economic success and material outcomes that we do not pause to consider whether the traits that generate these successes translates to the stuff that close relationships and families need to function and thrive. So said another way, our form of economy is making it very difficult for families to thrive. Emotional presence, empathy, respect, mutuality, and self-reflection are all required and none exists in capitalism. Research examining hierarchies indicate that those at the top of the hierarchy have better health and better stress than those who are lower on these socioeconomic hierarchies. Our economic and incentivization systems are a setup for failure and disappointment for those who are most vulnerable to experience the worst outcomes. The free market system has become the bellwether of a myriad systems in our culture, education, commercial, media, medical, and spiritual. We're not going to dismantle our extant capitalist systems, but can we safeguard mental health in the midst of this? We can and must reflect on how the drumbeat of economics impacts our minds and perhaps to keep alive the call that all people from vast corporate structures to individuals can pay it forward and remain mindful that in its fashion uh, that ontogeny, ontogeny in its fashion recapitulates economy. Excellence, innovation, growth, and remuneration are all admirable qualities and aspirations. The questions all of us must grapple with is at what price? There's some really heavy hitting things in here. Uh, and I wanted to share kind of how I digest some of this and we can talk more um, with compassion and, and capitalism, which she was pointing to here, exploitation of labor. 
it's capitalism is founded on that. Um, not only in its existing form, but the entire economy was built on the backs of slaves. So how does compassion fit into that? And every time we go to the grocery store and we participate in capitalism, we are reinforcing that exploitation of labor. Capitalism also often prioritizes profit over the well-being of workers, resulting in the exploitation of labor. Lack of concern for worker welfare is not aligned with compassion. Wealth inequity. Capitalism often leads to extreme wealth inequality, where small groups of individuals hold disproportionate amount of wealth and power. Uh, there's this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. A true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth, especially for those of us that are in the Bay Area where we see these giant towers, these kind of monuments to wealth, and then at their foot is people that are struggling to survive. And I'm not sure where the stress is worse. Is it the people that are living in those towers or is it the people that are on the street in front of it? There's a whole section that I, I have here about the damage to the planet, the exploitation of natural resources, consumerism and waste, um, that compassion is not compatible with that. How are we compassionate towards the communities that rely on the natural resources that capitalism is pillaging? Uh, inequitable access to healthcare. Under capitalism, healthcare is treated as a commodity to be bought and sold rather than a basic human right. How is that compassion? Uh, it requires us to prioritize the health and well being of all individuals, regardless of their ability to pay. And we have the resources to do this. It's just all being hoarded at the top levels of wealth. Um, emphasis on competition over cooperation, influence of money in politics, scarcity mindset, and consumerism. So the question, maybe this is something to reflect on during the week and we come back together next week um, for those that are interested that are di diving into this is how do we resolve that we live in a capitalist society that does not prioritize compassion or the well-being of the collective, rather the select few? It's hard. And we, you know, we heard in Perry's example, like how do we come to terms with when our ideology, if for the time being, we want to consider compassion as an ideology, feels a little off to say that, but if that's our ideology and we live in a culture and an economic system that is not conducive of that, how do we resolve that? I'm just, you know, curious to hear um, what that feels like for people. You know, we only have about five minutes left in the class, so we'll definitely continue into next week. But any any thoughts coming up as you as you hear kind of this relationship between capitalism and, and, and compassion? I'll jump back in, Jake. Um, <clears throat> it's like the question of how to be in the world, but not of it. Mm -hmm. So how do I be, how, how can I continue to be a socialist in a capitalist society, right? And you know, it, 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 thankfully, I'm in a democracy, capitalistic democracy ish, where I can, I have the power of my vote. I have the power of protest. I have the power of, of some small measure of influence in, in conversation and of persuasion. Um, so those are all things that tools that I can use. Uh, to try to affect change on a small level because i'm for, you know i'm not king of the world i can't change the system to make it more compassionate but i have seen that culture has soaked in into our capitalistic society in this country that progress has been made socially and progress is being made and it's being reflected in the way that companies treat their employees. The, the, the full benefits package at many employers that many employers offer now is way better than it used to be. And that was way better than it was when we started this capitalist society. When unions were, you know, if you were a union guy, you, you could be shot, you know, we're, we're not there anymore. So, I'm hopeful 
that the progress we are enjoying in society will continue to be reflected in how capitalism continues to develop. And what I'm hoping is that this is all a maturation process, that the capitalism that is um, starkly the bottom line is most important continues to evolve and soften because I have definitely seen it soften in my life. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I think, you know, like we can all start exploring ways that we can we can develop uh, or we can do it in our own way of kind of meeting meeting the system where it's at with our own compassion. And what are ways that we can do it? I think it is also important. I, I love the optimism. I love the, I do agree that there does seem to be an evolution yet, even within that example of the benefits package for workers increasing, uh, getting better than, than it was previously, but we still don't have equal access to those jobs. We still have so much oppression that people can't even get their foot in the door to receive the benefits of that. And that, you know, one of the things around the, inequitable access to healthcare. We we don't we don't make sure we don't have the safety net that everyone can access that. So yes, I do agree there is there are improvements and there is still a locked rigidity of oppression and discrimination and and holding down these these certain groups. Um, but I really appreciate it. not but and I really appreciate everything that you said. I have one thought which is uh kind of interesting and related if I don't know if you have time actually you may not have time but it's just yeah I think the key here would be like one thing is like like most ideological things still can't take over your full way of of your like what you call like primordial essence or awareness so you can always drop into that to keep getting more and more insight like that's been a thing un unless I'm like pass away that I could still probably have some access to that and I would think that that's more embodying like your day-to-day -day living, like how you're embodying your day-to-day -day living. It's not like you're taking down some really big macro like ideology mm -hmm. somewhere out there far away. It's mm -hmm. like convincing like an investor that it's better to invest in this thing than this thing because it'd right. be better for yeah. other people. And also like that, what are we investing in? We're investing in our future basically. So, yeah. and we're gonna be in the future together. It's like in COVID, like we're investing, we're all like connected in COVID, even though we're technically all isolated in our apartments locked down. So what are we investing in then? We're investing yeah. in values. So I think pointing that out is usually pretty useful. And then also embodying that is useful. I think one challenge is that um, like switching over again, like on the ideology thing, which is kind of relevant. I've noticed that one reason is because when people cite what's their alternative, they didn't cite a clearly articulated, significantly better alternative. And it sounds good on paper, but they didn't have an implementation or some sort of frame that will work. So that's why I was thinking, it's hard to convince people in a debate round of anything. You have to kind of work with people to make change happen. That's on a live by live basis. So- and Part of that, what you're, what you're saying also is, the, the convincing of another person is cognitive. The other person is never going to take action in a more beneficial construction way for the planet, for others, if they don't first feel it. And we can't feel it for other people. We can point to it, you know, we can have them come to a meditation class and feel their suffering. <laughs> but we have to, nothing will happen if it just stays in the mind. It, it also has to be that felt experience. So I, I do appreciate that you're saying that. And also, you started your comment around the kind of primordial um, innateness of these qualities. Like and every, say again, kind of like essence, like essence, essence right? That yeah. you know, part part of this 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 um, conversation around compassion is that it is there. It's not. It's something that we we might need to uncover, but that we all have. And, and we know this from the science, like if, if we didn't have the ability to feel compassion, then we wouldn't have this, re the, this research that shows us that we stop producing cortisol when we're compassionate, right? So that we all have the ability to tap into it. We might just need to practice kind of um, unveiling it or uncovering it. 
I really hate to stop the conversation because I feel like there's a lot here. I think um, we're, so we're at time. Um, thank you everyone for sharing. And uh, I feel, you know, we got the practice in, we got the beginning of the conversations and let's dedicate next week to picking up where we left off. Um, so for those of you that are interested in joining, maybe this week consider how are you participating in the world in a way that might be causing harm or how are ways that you can move through the world in a more compassionate um, embodied way of these ethics that we're talking about uh, in in the name of capitalism. We're, you're, we're not going to try and take down capitalism in this course. We're trying to feel and uh, navigate our way through cultivating a sense of ethical ways of meeting the world. Um, and if we all start doing that, then the ripple effect will will expand. So I I have a felt experience right now of feeling bad that we didn't get to hear from everyone and that um, there was there's a lot of potential robust discussion uh, here. So I look forward to continuing that next week. And thanks everyone for joining both the discussion and the practice. Maybe we can just all take a deep breath in together. And as we breathe out, we can send these aspirations to create a better world that begins with ourselves. So thank you all again for joining me tonight. I look forward to our conversation, our gathering next week. Uh, we are a dollar run organization, which is donation. Um, so we thrive on the generosity of our Sangha. Uh, these classes are free of charge. It's a gift that our generosity to the community uh, and anything that you can um, give to keep our center thriving and our teachers compensated, even if that's just a, a warm wish for alleviation from suffering, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, 